Hello everyone. So we are back with a new talk and it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Radu uh, Ioniciu, who is a senior research fellow at the Romanian National Institute of Physics and Nuclear Engineering. Uh, Radu founded and still coordinates the Romanian Quantum Network, aiming to develop and propagate quantum technologies in Romania and currently also coordinates the national strategy in quantum communications for Romania. And today here he will talk about a universal quantum order. So the stage is yours, Radu. Thank you, Zoltan. Uh, I think it's a very nice opportunity to speak here at the Quantum Eastern Europe. It's one of these uh, events which we, we have, we should have uh, more often. So in, this, in the... Uh, Quantum flagship, we talk about uh, improving the participation of uh, widening countries, and I think this is such an opportunity. It's a good opportunity to gather the community together. Yeah, okay, we also so, believe in this. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, an idea uh, I was working um, a couple of years ago about the universal quantum sorters. So let me see. Uh, so the the question is, how do you measure a qubit? We all know what a qubit is, a, a d-dimensional quantum system. And uh, it's clear that at the end of any computation, quantum computation, you have to measure uh, what's inside your quantum computer. And measurement is a fundamental process. Also, it's a fundamental process in any other uh, quantum technology, like uh, imaging or um, sensing. So clearly, it's, it's a central stage. Uh, thing which we have to deal with. Uh, so let's start with something which is simpler, uh, which is a qubit. Now, one of the uh, most useful qubits uh, we have, it's the polarization qubit in uh, photonics, and it's widely used in transmitting quantum information over uh, free space channels from satellites and so on. And I think it's probably one of the uh, best qubits ever because if you think of the polarization of a qubit of a photon, um, it lasts almost forever. So we we were able to measure the uh, polarization of the uh, photons from the cosmic microwave background. So photons basically which uh, interacted lastly with matter billions of years ago. So if you think in that terms, you, you can have the polarization qubit. It, it has a lifetime of billions of years. So one of the uh, most widespread uh, use of uh, measuring a polarization qubit is a polarizing beam splitter, PBS. So it's a block of uh, glass, specially designed glass, such that if you input uh, H or V photons, horiz horizontal of uh, vertical photons, uh, you will get uh, at the, the output 100% uh, transmitted and 100% uh, vertical reflected. So basically, if uh, H polarized photon enters, it will get with probability one, uh, it will be transmitted. And if it's uh, vertically polarized, it will be, be with probability one reflected. So basically, it sorts the photons in two optical special uh, modes. And you can see this, for example, the equivalent of a stern gelag device in which you have a, the spin of an electron or an atom. And after the device, after the inhomogeneous magnetic field, it goes one direction or the other direction. And this is very useful because usually the detectors are not polarization uh, sensitive. So you know that if you put two detectors at the end of your um, PBS, if you get a click in um, the vertical one, you know 100% sure that the um, polarization of the photon was phi, and the, the other way around, if it's it clicks H, you you know that. Uh, uh, so basically, this is a very useful device to have, and we have it for polarization, but we would like to have it also for other degrees of freedom. But now, uh, let's have a look at this from uh, the perspective of quantum information. So simply put a, a PBS, and this is known in the literature, it's just a C naught gate between the polarization degree of freedom and the mode degree of freedom. So the mode degree of freedom are the two special modes. You have two inputs on the PBS and two outputs. These are the special modes. And the polarization, of course, is the intrinsic polarization of the photon. 
and is nothing but a synod gate. And if you look at it in this way, it's easy to generalize it, and it's easy also to see how to make it work for other uh, degrees of freedom. So basically, you see here that uh, H polarized photon entering into mode K, it will go to the same mode K, and the V uh, polarized photon entering into to mode K will flip the mode. So clearly, it's a C0 gate. And of course, you can decompose it as I think every graduate student knows, you can decompose the C0 as uh, two Hadamard gates uh, and uh, control Z uh, sandwich between them. And this is very useful because now you can generalize this to more degrees of freedom. So now the idea was how would you measure another de degree of freedom and how would you measure this for QDITs? Okay, so this is what uh, uh, I've been working on some time ago with the universal quantum sorter. So the idea was to have an internal degree of freedom, sigma, call it sigma. It could be spin, it could be polarization, it could be orbital angular momentum, it could be uh, mass or wavelength or whatever. And what you want to do is to have a black box, box in which you input that uh, particle with the unknown degree of freedom and it outputs basically if the um, degree of freedom is zero it goes to output zero if it's one go goes to output one and so on so basically it sorts the um, the particle in different spatial modes according to the internal degree of freedom and now if you think of that this is just a simple control xd gate where the xd is the generalized Pauli uh, matrix for qdits and again, this is the same action. So S is the internal degree of freedom you want to sort. And K is the special mode. Of course, now, uh, because this is a QDIT and you want to sort a d-dimensional uh, degree of freedom, you need a d-dimensional uh, mode. You need a d-dimensional output mode. OK, so far, so good. So again, how would you do that in practice? Basically, you can decompose the XD gate again, like Fourier gate. Now, this is gen the generalization of the Hadamard gate in uh, two dimension, a Fourier and a Fourier dagger. Of course, now uh, F dagger is no longer equal to F, so only in D dimension, in two dimension, uh, the Hadamard it's its own uh, uh, dagger, and you have the control Z D gate. Now, this is a symmetric gate, so basically the control Z on the uh, uh, S mode degree of freedom can be reversed. So it's completely symmetric, so I can write the uh, control on the mode qubit, and uh, the action should be on the Z. Uh, and this is nice because I know what the control on the mode qubit means. So basically it means that I can apply the ZD gate differentially. So I apply on the first um, special mode uh, ZT, ZD to power 0, on, on uh, the second ZD to the power 1, up to ZD to the power D minus 1. And what are the uh, Fourier gates on the special mode? Uh, so basically here uh, above I uh, figured um, the quantum circuits and below are the special modes as you do it in uh, real life. Uh, so basically here you have a Fourier gate, which is a Fourier on the uh, special mode. And we know how to do Fourier gates because you just uh, mix everything with everything. So what happens now, this looks like, and it is actually a multi mode interferometer in which your particle with spin s or orbital angular momentum uh, l enters the interferometer it's put in a superposition of paths at the first uh, splitter then it encounters a differential zd gate according to which path it goes and then it interferes again with itself such that at the end it gets with probability one at the output corresponding to the internal degree of freedom. So another way of uh, seeing this, uh, I'll go back a slide. Uh, this is equivalent to a normal uh, interferometer in which the Hadamard gate is a beam splitter. And what you do, you put on one of the arms a differential phase shift, which shifts um, 
the uh, internal degree of freedom according to its value. So it's a ZD gate. If it's, let's say, spin uh, up or H, it gets uh, a phase zero. If it's spin down, it gets a phase minus one. And now you can see how it works because in a normal Max Zender interferometer, what you have is that you have complete, uh, sorry, you have um, perfect interference of uh, the spin up or uh, vertical polarized in one end, uh, on one end inputs, uh, sorry, outputs, and uh, perfect destructive interference on the other. And it works the same for the H. So basically in this case, H would output in the in your Max Zender interferometer, it will output with 100% probability, one uh, unit probability on one end and V with um, uh, the other uh, in the other output. So that's exactly how it works. Constructive and destructive interference depending on your uh, internal degree of freedom. And this is how you generalize it. You have a multi-mode interferometer in which you put differential phase shifts, which act on the degree of freedom you want to sort. And then by uh, interference, your particle would output exactly on the mode, the special mode, um, which is equal to the um, internal degree of freedom. So, and of course it works for any degree of freedom. You just have to tailor, uh, the F gate are the same because they are just um, Hadamard gate, sorry, Fourier gates on the mode, but you have to tailor your phase shifts according to the degree of freedom you want to sort. So if you want to sort uh, spin, you do the uh, ZD gates for the spin. If you want to sort orbital angular momentum, you have to do phase shifts for the angular momentum. So that's why it's kind of universal sort sorting device for any degree of freedom, just by um, changing what's in your sandwich, in the middle of your sandwich. Okay, so, so let's see a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is, um, uh, orbital angular moment to photon. So the photon, apart from the polarization, has also an internal degree of freedom, which is called orbital angular momentum. And uh, you can see it as an unbounded qubit. It can be L equals zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three. And it's a very good uh, qubit because it can be used for long distances and it has been uh, shown to propagate uh, 10 or 20 kilometers in free space. And of course, this degree of freedom uh, allows us to do all sorts of cool things uh, from coding, from um, uh, transmitting um, polarization invariant states and so on. And how would you do the sorting in this case? Well, the Fourier gate is the same because it's act on the special modes. You input your uh, photon on one, um, on the zero input. So basically you use all, for, for sorting, you always use only one um, input. And in the middle, you have dove prisms. So these are uh, kind of glass prisms. And you rotate them according to uh, an angle, alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha j, alpha up to d minus 1, where alpha k is k pi over d. So by, by rotating them, so for example, alpha 0 is just rotated by 0 degrees. The alpha 1 is rotated by uh, pi over d, and so up to d minus 1 over d uh, times pi. So by inputting these type of phase shifts differential on different paths, you make sure that at the end, uh, the orbital angular momentum zero will exit on output zero, orbital angular momentum one will output on mode one and so on. So basically what happens, uh, the question is what happens if you have a superposition of um, orbital angular momentum? Well, obviously you'll get entanglement. So basically, uh, like it happens also if you put um, a plus polarized photon on a PBS. So uh, you'll have a superposition of uh, H on mode one, uh, sorry, H on mode zero and V on mode one. So it's an entangled uh, state of a photon uh, between polarization and, um, and special mode. Here, the same, you have an entanglement between orbital angular momentum and special mode. Okay, so let's see uh, a couple of examples what uh, else you can do with this uh, sorting device. Um, 
The second application would be to manipulate or, or orbital angular momentum states. So uh, this is a difficult uh, problem because um, what you have to do is, for example, to be able to prepare any um, state of or orbital angular momentum, so any QD state, you need to apply XD gates, which are the generalization of uh, Pauli X gate. Now, uh, K uh, plus one, this XOR is uh, addition modulo D, not modulo one. And the same for ZD gate is omega to the K, where omega is uh, root of unity of order day, of, of order D. Uh, and once you do this type of gates, it's easy to prepare any um, uh, QD in orbital angular momentum. Now, the ZD gate are quite easy to do. Is uh, You can do them with Dov prism, as I've shown before. But the XD were quite difficult, because you just don't have the uh, devices in the lab uh, to do that. Um, what you have uh, in the lab, it's what is called a spiral faceplate which can shift the orbital angular momentum by one unit, or if you stack n such uh, uh, SPPs, you get uh, orbital angular momentum from L to L plus n. But note that here it's plus uh, and not uh, XOR. So basically, if you do 0 will go to 1, 1 will go to 2, but then D will go to D minus 1. So you get outside your uh, Hilbert space. So what would you like is to do D goes back to 0. So it's a circular, basically it's a circular um, permutation gate. And uh, this is where it helps. And this is the uh, way of doing a circular, circular permutation XD uh, using the um, sorters. So basically, uh, you shift by one all the uh, modes, which come zero goes to one, one goes to two, and so on. And of course, D goes will go to D plus one. But then the nice thing about the uh, sorter is that it's circular. So basically, when you sort a D plus one uh, orbital angular momentum, it will not go to exit D plus one because you don't have, you have only D. It will go back to zero. And of course, it's easy because now you can uh, do minus D spiral face plate. So D plus one will go, sorry, D will go to zero, and then you sort it back. So basically, with two sorters and the spiral face plate, you can do uh, your um, Pauli XD gate. And you can generalize it, you can play with these things, and um, you can do many other things like uh, you. Um, you do a circular shift with L plus P, uh, not only L plus one. And this is nice because you can play with many other things. OK, another uh, application is uh, to orbital angular momentum tomography. And uh, you have um, a density matrix, which has, of course, d square parameters, d square minus one, actually. And um, you write it in this way. Um, where the expectation values of the QLM operators are uh, the basically the trace of rho uh, on QLM. And QLM are just uh, products of Pauli matrices, ZD and XD, plus uh, Hermitian conjugate. And it has been uh, shown by Asadian that uh, basically you can use uh, DQC1, so the deterministic quantum computation with one qubit, to measure uh, these um, traces. So the circuit looks like this. Uh, you have a qubit. It's the standard. It's very similar to DQC1, but uh, the only difference is that you have the qubit on the upper part. It's a two-dimensional system, and your d-dimensional matrix of uh, the orbital angular momentum here. And if you do these gates, these are just close to Hadamard gates and some phase shifts, then uh, by measuring uh, only the um, qubit here and throwing the qubit uh, uh, without measuring it, you get basically uh, the expectation values are exactly the equivalent. And basically, you translate this uh, uh, scheme into a mode, a special mode. Basically, it's an interferometer in which you do um, inside these uh, ZDL and XDM, L and M are the powers uh, which you want to, to measure because you have all these coefficients from 0 to D minus 1. And uh, by measuring um, uh, only a qubit, 
you get uh, the expectation value which you want. And this is how you do a tomography for a D uh, for um, your uh, your QDIT. Uh, another application uh, we've been doing uh, with um, our group. I have five minutes. Um, I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, is to use it in um, interaction free imaging. So basically, you want to image a multi pixel object. So, is this uh, object here uh, shown in gray? And what you want to do is to use uh, the standard scheme of interaction free imaging for a multi pixel um, object. Uh, and of course, one way to do that is you need an internal degree of freedom in which to encode the zero and ones of your image. And uh, this is the interferometer. It's a kind of Michelson interferometer, it's multi-pass. And in the end, you use a sorter here inside and a sorter outside to uh, uh, read the information about the, um, the object. OK, um, another application, again, the same sorter you want to use uh, to do interferometric mass spectro spectroscopy or spectrometry. And usually what you have, you have a mass separator. You, you have your particles of masses M1, M2, Mn, and you want to sort them according to different channels. So you do that, for example, it's very useful in um, uh, carbon, uh, um, carbon 12 and carbon 14 uh, mass spectrometry. And uh, you, you use that for uh, archaeology, for uh, dating objects, and, and so on. And again, translating the same idea of the interferometer, uh, you have your input masses here. They have to uh, be in the same velocity. Uh, you have a waveguide array, and the um, waveguides have different wavelengths. Sorry, uh, they have different lengths, L0 to L minus 1. And again, what you want to do is by um, interfering in this multi-waveguide uh, array, you want M0, so the mass uh, 0, 2 output with probability 1 at 1 input, uh, what 1 output and mass n minus 1 at uh, uh, the other output and so on. And there is a simple condition. You can write the conditions. And basically, you have to obey um, this uh, uh, equation here, which says that the difference between uh, length s and L0, the first one, should be uh, a multiple of the uh, the Broil wavelength. So that's way by obeying this condition, you have perfect interference uh, for all the masses in their respective outputs. OK, so to sum it, sum it up, basically, the quantum sorter is an interferometric sorting device for any degree of freedom. And it has multiple applications in measuring photonic orbital angular momentum, manipulating orbital angular, angular momentum QDs. You can do the cyclic XD gates, which was very difficult to do so far. Uh, tomography, again, uh, multi-pixel. We've shown that you can do multi-pixel interaction for imaging uh, and uh, another application, interferometric mass uh, spectroscopy. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Radu, for this really interesting talk. I mean, this application is superb. At the presently, I don't see any uh, questions, so I will uh, start with my own question. So, um, so how are the uh, have are you collaborating? Like, how are the experiments going? Uh, are you like uh, setting collaborating with some team here in the sense of realizing? So, and uh, I've these... seen a couple of articles in which they measured uh, not orbital angular momentum. So basically, they use this idea which was uh, described uh, here for sorting, but not for orbital angular momentum, mm -hmm. but for uh, the R, because uh, you have L. Um, when, you, when you deal with uh, photons and the transverse mode of the photons, you have two numbers. Uh, one is the orbital angular momentum, and the other one is uh, R, which is the kind right. of radial number. And I know that uh, two groups have measured that using similar uh, ideas to, to these ones. Uh, one, I think, was Seilinger's group, and one the other one was Boyd's group. In uh, uh, I don't have the references uh, with me, but I, I can find them out for you. So And basically, they use this idea for uh, sorting um, 
because they have different way of sorting orbit angular with some very complex lenses. And then they want to use this uh, interferometric sorting for uh, radial numbers. And they did. And, and would, would, are you planning to contact any of these groups or, or with your ideas or? So they already did it. That's what I'm trying to say. So. Yeah, I mean, right, right. But I mean, I, you had I, those other I applications. I to Boyd, to mm -hmm. Robert Boyd at the conference, and basically he was interested in the idea, and that's uh, mm -hmm. that he basically I sent him the article, um, and he implemented his group implemented uh, for mm -hmm. uh, radio. Okay. Moment. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, if there are. No further questions. By the way, thank you very much for keeping the time. That's perfect. We are on perfect time. Then uh, let's move to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much.